Well, welcome everybody. We are in the computing session three, reinforcement learning and AI. I'd like to thank everybody that's attending this session. And we have four papers. And then we start to the first paper. So please, can you put the first paper on? So the first paper is two level control of non-player characters for navigation in 3D game scenes, a deep reinforcement learning approach. Jose Amigo Gomes, Creto Vidal, eu, Yuri Leno, uh, Universidade Federal do Ceará. So please, Jose Amigo is gonna present. So please, you can start, Jose Amigo. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Okay. My name is Jose Amigo Gomes. I will present the paper entitled Two Level Control of Non Play Characters for Navigation in Three Dimensional Game Scene, a Deep Reinforcement Learn Approach. I made this work in collaboration with the Professor Escreto Vidal, Joaquim Bento, and Yuri Nogueira at Federal, Univ Federal University of Ceará. Let's play. Let's start with navigation problem games. The generation of navigation behaviors is a typical problem when dealing with non-play characters. The classical approach for this problem is pathfind algorithms in a navigation mesh. On the right, we can see a navigation a mesh that guiding agents navigation to start point to end point. For more autonomous characters, recent works use deep reinforcement learn. We realize that papers related to general navigation problem in games do not consider the navigation problem for animated characters. Here, we exemplify two works. The first is one of the most cited in navigation problems in complex environments. The second is one of the most recent game-focused ones. Let, let's start with Mirovsky et al. that presents a robust approach based on A3C algorithm, but it is based on first-person view of the scene. So, they do not show character avatar. In, uh, on the other range, Alonso et al. use a scalable deep reinforcement learning approach. They use soft chat actor critical algorithm and sensors get environment three dimensional structure, but they use as a character avatar as simple as box. We have some problems. In video games, the navigation of non-player characters usually requires animations of right-level actions as walking, running, and jumping. In principle, the agent would learn low-level control of joints and bones to produce believable movements. But this is, this is a very slow, resource-hungry, and complex approach. It's very hard defining a reward function for this problem. For this problem, on the other end, motion capture and manual animation is very robust and adopted approach in game and animation industry. It's the question: Is there a robust way to combine reinforcement learning with a traditional animation controller? For this. We made a first step towards deep reinforcement learning as a robust approach to navigation problem of animated characters. So, in this work, the navigation problem was, was modeled as a Markovian decision process. The agent learns mapping two, two kinds of inputs in a suitable action. The kinds of inputs are a sequence of images 
and the list of real numbers described characters internal state. Our approach is illustrating the following figure and uses A3C algorithm and the humanoid character with a pre-made animation controller supporting walking, running, and jumping action. The neural network sends an action to character controller. The character controller sends a low-level comment based in an action received from the neural network. And in the mission controller, apply, apply motion capture data and fiscal force to the agent bar based on comment received from the animation controller. The neural network learns a probability distribution of the actions and a state value function from input data and has four components, a feature extra extractor la layer, hidden layers, a policy layer, and a state value layer. On the right side here, we can see its feature extractor layer that is a convolutional neural network processing and image sequence and a multi-layer perceptual network processing linear input. Hidden layers may be a fit forward or a long short term memory network. Here and here. We can see that state value and policy layers share the reading layers. Here we show the character controller interaction with the neural network. The character controller receives an action from the neural network and builds low level comment with necessary animation parameters. For example, in this figure, the character controller receives an, an, the action model and builds the low level comment with the parameter f that indicates which animation to perform. The animation controller receives the appropriate animation code, calculates agent's velocity, and apply walking animation to agent's virtual bar. To evaluate our approach, we performed navigation experiments in a three-dimensional environment con containing buildings with stairs, ramps, and obstacles. We trained four agents configuration, the base configuration and three variations. The base configurations, configuration is a convolutional fit forward network and percepts internal animation status. The animation status is the avatar situation. For example, whether the agent is in the air or on the floor. The first variation, var one, also uses convolutional neural network, but it not know the animation status. If these two versions, we test if animation status is a relevant, relevant state formation. The other variations use animation status, but with a long short term neural network. With this variation, we can check if the agent benefits from the new network memory. We realized uh, the experiments in two states. In the first stage, we train the agent in a random environment. In the second stage, we run this agent in a different random environment. In the second stage, environment is initialized with a different seed that the seed used in the first stage. With the second stage, we test the general generalization performance forms of our reinforcement learning system. So we get this result in the train stage. In horizontal axis, we can see the train, the train step. In the vertical axis, we can see the average success rate. The base agent, the red line, got the best forms. 
So feed forward network is a robust baseline for navigation problems of animated characters. Also, the var one agent loads performance performance because do not use animation studies. Long short term memory versions get the worst performance in this problem. Test results confirm training results. We can see a baseline agent, red line get a better generalization performance because its test performance is close to the train, training performance. Our conclusions. We showed that, that animation controller adds extra complexity hindering the learning convergence. We also show that our reinforcement learning system is efficient for the point-to-point -point navigation problem of animation virtual characters. However, there is still a number of problems that need to be solved if reinforcement learning systems are viable candidates to replace approaches of the classic navigation mesh. Among those problems, we can mention generalization of scene behavior variability, navigation problem with problems along the way, and navigation in open world games. Some reference used in this paper. Thanks a lot. See ya. Okay, Yuzami, thank you. We have time for questions. Let's wait a little bit here. Um, well, I'm the co-author, but just very quick. Uh, what are your thoughts about expanding this work? I mean, what is the, very quickly, what would be the, the future? Would the, could you use this approach and expand it or improve it? What do you think? Uh, I use the, uh, I, can you repeat the, your question, please? This or approach, write. this approach. So do you think of expanding the, the approach, for example, improving or using other problems yes uh, this approach can be used can be used in in, in other uh, problems in, in in games for example we can uh, we can use this approach for for vir virtual reality and uh, so uh, I, I don't okay. know. No, no, okay, that, that's what I'm saying. You can use it in other approaches and other problems, right? That's what I, yes. that's what I was asking. Okay, um, I don't see more questions in the Discord. Let's see, no. Okay, thank you, Jusami. We can thank move you. to the thank other paper. For, for okay. So the next paper is Jim Hero a research environment for reinforcement learning agents in rhythm games. Romulo Filho, Yuri Leno, Creto Vidal, myself, and Paulo Sarafim, Federal, Universidade Federal do Ceará. So you can start, please. Hi, everyone. I'm just presenting my screen, one moment. Okay, I guess you can see. So, hello everyone, I'm Romulo Ferre Filho, and today I'm going to present the, the work Team Hero, a research learning environment for reinforcement learning agents in rhythm games which was developed in conjunction with Yuri Nogueira, Creto Vidal, Joaquim Cavalcanti Neto, and Paulo Serafim, as Professor Bento already said. Well, first we present the introduction for this work and a quick background. Then we show the methodology followed by the results and discussion on the experiments executed. Finally, we present our conclusion. 
Well, the interest in building machines capable of defeating humans in games is very old. In the 18th century, a machine known as the Turk beat popular personalities such as Benjamin Franklin only to be revealed as a fraud in the 19th century. Also, in 1997, IBM's Deep Blue beat Garry Kasparov, which was a chess world champion by the, day, by the time, uh, on a chess match. In recent years, the combination of autonomous reinforcement learning agents with video games has brought interesting results. Emni et al. showed in 2013 an agent capable of winning Atari 2600 games. Vinyas et al. showed in 2019 an agent that beat a professional StarCraft II player. Well, our proposal then is to present a new environment for training and evaluation of reinforcement learning algorithms and verify the environment effectivity through the development of an autonomous agent capable of playing the rhythm game presented. So, what is a rhythm game? Rhythm games are a subgenre of action games that challenge the player to follow a rhythm. Um, they usually are divided into two groups, dance games and music games. Sorry, I think the video just stopped. Um, well, one rhythm game that stands out is Guitar Hero, which was created by Harmonix Music Systems uh, in 2006. Uh, in the video here, we can see how the game works. So, um, there are uh, five colored buttons corresponding to the notes that slide down the screen. On the right, we can see the rock meter. If it reaches the minimum, the song ends. And on the, lev on the left, we can see the score counter and a multiplier that range from one to four. So, here is the rock meter. Here's the score counter, the five colored buttons, the path where the notes come from. Uh, also, reinforcement learning. We, we need to understand a little bit of, of reinforcement learning to understand our paper. So, reinforcement learning is a machine learning paradigm focused on solving sequential decision problems. A traditional scenario is composed of two entities, agent and environment. The agent uh, receives an observation of the current state of the environment performs an action and receives back a new state and a numerical value called a reward. So the agent's goal is to maximize the total sum of the rewards obtained over time. For this, you need to find the correct action between, uh, sorry, you need to find the correct action to be taken in each state. And this mapping of states and actions is what we call a policy. Uh, deep reinforcement learning is uh, an approach to reinforcement learning that uses uh, neural networks to estimate the policy. Uh, on this work, we use the DeepQ network algorithm, which is an updated version of the Q-learning algorithm, which uses a deep, a deep neural network to estimate the best policy. Uh, our methodology, we developed... Um, excuse me, uh, there... I have a message here saying that I can't, I don't have permission to reproduce a video on this. I'm not sure. Oh, okay, I'll just keep going. But uh, we developed a a two D day a two D game using Python and uh, the Pi Game Engine, which is a clone of the Guitar Hero um, game. For this, we created notes which are colored circles, uh, 60 pixels tall and 60 pixels wide. And they follow the same color patterns from Guitar Hero. So green, red, yellow, blue, and orange. To differentiate uh, the notes from the buttons, we painted the central circle from the buttons black. Uh, we also uh, implemented a song, well, music in the game, where we randomly generated them during the execution. And since the agents only use the vision to play, the agent we developed, uh, we did not use audio. So, for example, you, we have here a example of a song chart, where on the left we have the position of a note, on the right we have the type, color, and duration. So, uh, on the first line we can see that a green note, which is the zero color, uh, with uh, just one um, duration, yeah, it's just a single note. Uh, is positioned at the position 38 and then the 96, uh, 144, and then on. And this song chart in the game can be seen as this. So we have a green note at position 48, then red, then yellow, then blue, and last, the orange. Uh, let's follow. 
So we also implemented the score and it was implemented uh, the same way as Guitar Hero. So it consists of a point counter, a score counter, sorry, uh, that increases for each score hit 10 points times the current multiplier that ranges from one to four. Also, we implemented the rock meter using the same colors, uh, which green indicates a good result and red indicates a bad result. So if the player reaches the far left of the red band, uh, the song ends earlier, which means that the player failed. He couldn't play until the end of the song. Well, our agent, the only information that our agent uses is the game screen itself. So we applied some pre-processing to the image that the agent receives. The steps we applied were, first, we transform the color image to grayscale, as we can see here. Then we do a crop um, at the left and top to remove the unused region uh, containing their score. So we cropped this black bar here and some bars here on the top. And lastly, we resize it to um, 48 by 54 pixels wide. Well, our neural network architecture can be seen here. It was um, adapted from the work of Serafin et al, presented in the SB Games 2020. And um, so, how do you create an agent in Gym Hero? Let's remember that Gym Hero is actually an environment for evaluation of agents. So, to create an agent is really simple. You just need to import the environment, you initiate it using the Gym Hero env class here, and you run the agent following the Gym pattern. So, Gym is a, a standard pattern for reinforcement learning agents uh, and environments. So with just a few lines of code, 18 total here, we can run a random agent uh, that will took uh, random actions at each time step. Well, our results in discussion for this, we trained three agents, one on easy, one on medium, and one on export, expert. Each one was trained during 20 epochs of 200 training episodes and 100 test episodes. Uh, the agent that played on easy obtained these results that we can see here. And uh, we can say that it learned to play on the easy difficulty. Uh, I, I think you guys can see here on this video. I'm not sure if the video is showing because of StreamYard. I have this message here. But let's keep going. Uh, we also trained an agent on medium, which obtained these rewards. Uh, this is the average reward chart, the average accuracy chart. And um, the agents also learn to play on the medium difficulty, as we can see in this video. But we can see that it doesn't achieve the same uh, result as the easy one. Sometimes it, it stays around in the yellow area of the rock meter, but still it learned to play on the medium difficulty. Well, last but not least, we can evaluate here our expert agent, which, as you can see from these charts, it didn't learn to play on expert difficulty right. So uh, in this video, you can see that the song ends really quickly. Sometimes you can even uh, see uh, more than one or two seconds of the game because the unit fails already. And this happens because of the action space here that it's actually uh, 32 possible actions for each frame. Well. We also compared our agent to a random agent as a control group. And um, the random agent was uh, was trained, well, not trained, was tested during 200 episodes on the same difficulties. So easy, medium, and expert. And we collected the same metrics, um, average reward and average precision. Uh, we can see here uh, our comparison where we can see that the agent that played uh, on the random agents failed all of the of the songs of the test episodes, so it, the the average reward was uh, a negative number. And comparing to our reinforcement learning agent, we have a a high score, a high reward um, score, indicating that the agent performed well. And we can see here that our expert agent obtained a similar result to the random agent. Uh, stating that they actually couldn't learn how to play on expert difficulty. So to conclude, uh, we can see here in this chart, in this table, that uh, we achieved our main work objective, which was the proposal of a virtual environment for training and evaluation of reinforcement learning in, in rhythm games. 
uh, and we can see this by, because of our uh, game that we developed and the gym environment that was uh, developed alongside it. Uh, we also created a, we wanted to create a rhythm game similar to Guitar Hero, which was developed. We trained a reinforcement learning agent. We trained three different ones, each one using uh, the, difficulties, the difficulties developed. And we showed that some of the agents were capable to play, um, which means that our environment can, um, it is able to evaluate an algorithm, a training, uh, agent, a training and evaluation algorithm for reinforcement learning. So as future work, we want to compare the agents developed against, hum uh, against human players. And we also want to evaluate different neural network architectures and algorithms since we used uh, GQN, which is a, well, it, it, it's, it's a, a node technique and there are better ones now. We also want to apply curriculum learning using all levels of difficulty because we believe that if the agent can be trained on easy medium and experts separately, then we can use this, uh, this learning that it obtained in all levels to train uh, by following a curriculum. Well, that's my presentation. Thank you, guys. Any questions? Okay, thanks, Homolo. Nice presentation. Uh, we do have questions. Very good. Uh, well, Augusto, Augusto Baffa, I don't know if you see the question, but I'm going to read anyway. Do you think that it's do you think that it's possible to fine tune the precision during a hard game based on another iteration to set the granularity of the timing? And by variable, he means more di dimensions. Oh, it's here in the YouTube. Um, to fine tune the precision during a hard game based in another variation to set the granularity of the timing. I'm not sure what it mean what what he means by granularity of timing here, but we can do uh, fine tune our agents using the well, all of the all of the difficulty levels. We just left the hard one out on this um, approach because it has the same number of notes uh, from the expert version, so it wouldn't differ uh, from the expert version. What we could do is. Uh, refine our algorithm to re generate uh, the random songs. So they are uh, randomly generated during um, the execution by sampling the action space for that difficulty level. So um, every, every state, uh, every song, sorry, uh, is created by, by sampling the action space uh, for the duration of the song. So if we have like a three three second song, maybe um, we would sample for the the medium uh, each frame. We have sixty frames per second, so we would have one hundred and eighty different actions in this using the five uh, main um, the five main colors using hard. We could uh, refine this algorithm to maybe using uh, on expert. You just pick randomly from the action space, but on hard you pick sometimes, you pick from four nodes, sometimes you pick from five, because that's how the original game works. You have this difference on the number of, of orange nodes from uh, hard to expert. Okay, uh, we, uh, we have time for one more quick question, but I, I, I ask you to not elaborate too much, okay? Because you have another okay. paper. So do you plan to compare your approach with another one like genetic algorithm? Well, we we didn't have plans to compare with genetic algorithms. Uh, we also we actually wanted to compare with another uh, reinforcement learning algorithms. So, but it will be available on GitHub the project, so you can then try it. Okay, yeah, it's good to try. Maybe even with genetic algorithms, maybe in the future. Who yeah. knows? No? It's an option. Okay, thanks, Homolo. Okay, thank nice you. Nice work. Let's go to another one, please. Okay, our next work is systematic choice of video game benchmarks in deep reinforcement learning. Elvio Gomes and Marlo Souza. So please go ahead.
Okay, and good afternoon all. I am Elf Gomes. I will present this paper, Systematic Choice of Video Game Benchmarks in Deep Reinforcement Learning. And in, this is a little summary of our presentation. And we will talk, uh, we'll start talking about Deep Reinforcement Learning. Deep Reinforcement Learning is basically the union of Reinforcement Learning and Deep Learning. It was created with the DKN proposal. Uh, they used reinforcement learning to solve problems of high dimensionality, what was not common uh, until, uh, until DKN. And reinforcement learning was normally used to low dimensionality problems. And I think that we, we have to say here is that DKN used video games as benchmarks and using uh, pixels, uh, pixels mat matrix yeah, as input, like uh, humans like human see uh, we see the game screen and they these algorithms use uh, pixels matrix like uh, us so they use video games as benchmarks they use a lot of video video games as benchmarks first uh, the key proposal was with 49 atari video games but why they use video games? First of all, they are uh, good environments to intelligent agents. They are dynamic environments and they have multiple, multiple rewards. Uh, even games that have a um, very specific objective, they have implicit multiple rewards normally. Um, and what's the motivation to study them? Because DKN brings innovation and really uh, excitement to this this new field and a lot was done that after that but without the care of benchmark choice benchmarks are not uh, choices well we think and normally benchmarks are to choose uh, just comparing with previous previous words but deep reinforcement learning algorithms are expensive uh, in time and computational resources and if you have a lot of benchmarks you can have a lot of time and um, so we think that a good choice of benchmarks will gain time and computational resource computational resource so our proposal is basically to create a methodology to choose video games benchmarks in a systematically way that reduce repetitive environments and guarantee diversity in these environments to, to that, we need to use game classification. Games classification, that is a field of game design researches. And uh, we think that few students have to characterize these games systematically. And games are normally classified with comparing, comparisons or uh, aesthetics and artistic, artistic expressions, like it's a 2D game, it's a pixel art game but we need an, uh, for more analytical, more systematic. So we choose a game topology proposed by Everdon and Narsef. Uh, they use game design characteristics and it's, uh, it's, this topology can be used to virtual and physical games. They divided this topology in eight math categories. These math categories are divided in 17 dimensions. For example, one meta category is game state that have two dimensions, mutability and savability. Mutability is based on if the agent can have mutations like power ups, and savability is based if the game can be saved or not. So our proposal is basically divided in five steps. Uh, we have to first step to select an initial set initial game selection uh, we think that a huge uh, game set will be better so the, all these games will be a uh, candidate to uh, benchmark in step two we choose a game topology here we suggest to suggest to the ever done and at step three we need to make a classification of our games in step four, after the classification, we need to clusterize and uh, put all this game together in groups. And uh, after 
this step in, in last step, we need to take uh, to remove uh, games that are in the same group because we think that uh, games with same features, same characteristics are uh, not are repetitive, are not to, uh, will not bring many to our to our algorithms. So uh, we, we did an experimental uh, in one analysis and we take 15, 55 games from literature, uh, all these papers, and we choose these games based in, in previous works. Um, with that games, in step two, we choose an overdone topology. And after that, in step three, we we classified all these games. Where to classify games, we started playing all them and uh, trying seeing videos, this kind of things. With that that uh, fifty five games, we clusterized in thirty one clusters in thirty one groups, and after that, we removed uh, this game. We removed games and all groups uh, will be with only one game at, at the end. So I, I, we removed uh, a lot in the almost 14.5 of benchmark size reductions. But we have, a, we have a reduction, we removed a lot, but we need to know if this remove, it, it can be removed, this game can be removed. So we basically need to know if the performance of deeper effort algorithms is statistically equivalent within all games in the same groups. Uh, we want to know if that methodology can get games that represent well the environment and if it's enough to validate new algorithms and without loss, basically it's that. So we have two experiments. Uh, this experiment was done with DKN and DKN and variations. We normalize, we need normalize the, the scores because uh, in the same group we can have different games uh, with different ranges. So uh, we need to normalize all them. To normalize, we use the random agent. In this, uh, this random agent was taking a random action after 10 hertz and we did it for 10, 100 times per game. In experiment one, using DKN, we take uh, 49 games in 13 groups, and we tested similarity between games, all games, one by one, testing the similarity uh, with the same group, different groups, all games. So we take this game, these groups, this, this analysis, and we take this hypothesis student test. And um, after that, we take p values, uh, variance, and means. We, we saw that same groups that have a small p value variance and small p value mean. Different group, games from different groups have um, p value and um, bigger p value and bigger variance too. But this first experiment is only with DKN algorithm. And we, we want to know if new algorithms can use that benchmark, where if it will be representative. So we use six DKN and DKN variation, six algorithms, and we grouped all uh, games with uh, values from these six algorithms. So we take these results distribution per game and test again a similarity between all games, between one by one. After that, we take a hypothesis student test and analysis the p-values from these hypothesis groups. Again, we have a very uh, a minor p-value mean in, same, in games from same group and a major uh, p-value mean in variance in different in games from different groups. So with that, we, we can conclude that 
uh, this this systematically choice uh, can choose can reduce bench, benchmarks choice uh, from what normally was done in, 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 by community and we can do we can say that the, that methodology can be used to prove diversity in benchmarks because they take group they remove uh, games that are very similar so uh, benchmarks with a lot of games similar will not be will be uh, punished by them that's it that was our references and thanks thanks Elvio. we have time for questions let me ask you a question it's more a curiosity but um <laughs> You said that this methodology can prove diversity in benchmarks. So my question is, uh, can you say that only for video games or another type of benchmark? For example, uh, you said that they use video games for benchmarks, but are you aware of any other type of benchmarks for reinforcement learning? And if you are, if you are aware, can you, do you think that you can expand this methodology for these different types of benchmarks? Yes, we think that yes. First of all, we started we started using Atari video games, but we think that you choosing a um, uh, game, we use the game typology. So if you 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 will use another thing, another I, I don't know what you will you use. We, you you need another uh, classification another for another way to classify them if you if you choose that I think that's yes it's possible okay thank you let's see if we have more questions um, okay I believe not so thanks all of you that's what thank you all. And I move to the other one, please. And our final work is Centralized Critic per Knowledge for Cooperate Multi-Agent Environments. Thais Ferreira, Esteban Klua, and Troy Co-Walter. Please, go ahead. Hi everyone. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Thais Ferreira, and today I will present the paper "Centralized Critical Per Knowledge for Cooperative Multi-Agent Game Environments." The research was conducted by me and Professor Esteban Klua and Troy Walter. I will present an introduction, the Centralized Critical Per Knowledge proposal, the experiments conducted, the results, and the conclusion of the work. Um, our work focuses on the concepts of training multiple intelligent agents in cooperative games, more specifically on multi-agent reinforcement learning with centralized training and decentralized execution. In this type of training, there is a centralized critic responsible for coordinating all the agents in the group. If all agents in the same group have the same behavior and work cooperatively to achieve the same goal. We use centralized training with decentralized execution because in a simulation environment such as games, we usually have access to the full state and information in the training phase. Therefore, it's possible to use this knowledge combined with the centralized execution since the agents cannot have access to the full state during the execution phase. In this context, the motivation for this work starts from the following problem. The environment is complex and the agents perform is not very good because the centralized critic has difficulty coordinating many agents with many observations. We propose to split the agents in different groups, each group coordinated by specific critics. With this division, the critics coordinate fewer agents with fewer observations. 
Our goal is to validate whether the division of knowledge about the environment by different groups, different centralized critics, improves learning performance in multi-agency environments or not. In this section, we will explain a little more about our approach. Let's suppose there is only one group composed of 12 agents in the environment. All agents in this group have the same behavior and are coordinated by the same critic. We can think that the greater the number of agents and their observations, the more difficult it is for the critic to coordinate them. If the task to be performed by the group is complex, this becomes worse. So we can think of dividing this task among different groups. Each group will have fewer agents and they may have fewer observations. For each group, there is a specific critic. In this scenario, the critics are less overloaded. However, since each group has different behaviors, we need to train diverse neural networks, which will influence the training type of the agents. We will verify this in our case later. Later, sorry. The scenario where there is no division is called common knowledge. In the scenario after the division of tasks and observation is called the distribu distributed knowledge scenario. Now I will, will show you the experiments conducted. Uh, the MEA POC algorithm was used in the test because it allows centralized training with independent policy learning. The experiments are performed using the unit ML agents toolkit. We apply and test the approach in two different environments, the escape environment and the survive environment. Let's talk about the vision escape environments. In the common knowledge scenario, there is one group the goal is to escape from the delusion. To do this, the agents must work cooperatively to get the sword, defeat the enemy, get the key he drops, and open the delusion door. All agents collect observations about who has the sword and who has the key. The agent's recast sensor contains the sword and key tags. All agents can take the sword and the key. In the dist distributed knowledge scenario, the agents were divided into two different groups. The sword group is respons responsible for collecting the sword and defeating the dragon. This word group recast sensor contains this word tag, but it does not contain the key tag. And the key group is responsible for collecting the key and open the door. The key group recast sensor contains the key tag, but does not contain this word tag. In this configuration, each group has a centralized critic. In the survival environment, the episode completes successful when the agents collect the necessary resources before the night arrives. This environment has 12 agents that need to collect water, food, and light to bonfires. To take the water, the agents need a bottle. To take the food, the agents need a bag. And to light the bonfire, the agents need wood. In the common knowledge scenario, all agents can take the bag, bottle, wood, water, food, and light the bonfire. In the distributed knowledge scenario, the agents were divided into three different groups. The food group is responsible for collecting the bag and taking the food. This group collects information only about who has the bag. The water group is responsible for collecting the bottle and taking the water. This group collects information only about who has the bottle. The bonfire group is responsible for collecting the wood and lighting the bonfire. This group collects information only about who has the wood. In this section, we will look at the results obtained. Our goal is to validate whether the division of knowledge about the environment by different groups improves learning performance in multi-agent environments or not. We want to analyze how the division of knowledge influences the gain of group rewards, the episode length, the entropy, and the value estimated. Uh, the group cumulative rewards, the mean cumulative episode reward overall groups and its spectators to increase during successful training session. The image on the left shows the resulting graph for the division escape environment. The group that accumulated the most reward was this word group. It occurs because this group is rewarded as soon as the dragon is defeated. In general, the group cumulative reward for the common knowledge scenario grows more slowly than the others. It occurs because this group needs to perform more tasks to achieve the goal and be rewarded. About the survive environment, we run two tests for the common knowledge scenario. The orange and red lines refer to the tests in the common knowledge scenario. The common knowledge scenario showed lower mean cumulative rewards than distribu distributed knowledge scenario. The episode length is the mean length of each episode in the environment for all agents. By analyzing the average episode duration, we can get a sense of whether or not the agents are taking longer to complete their tasks. About the division escape environment, the episode length for this word group is always shorter compared to the other groups. About the surviving environment, the division of tasks and observations between the groups causes the agents to complete this episode more quickly. 
the entropy means how random the decisions of the model are expected to slowly decrease during a successful training process. About the dangerous escape environment, there is not much difference between the two scenarios. About the survival environment, the entropy values for the distributed knowledge scenario indicate that the groups are learning faster and make fewer random decisions. The value estimates correspond to how much future reward the agent predicts itself receiving at any given point. This value shows uh, this value should increase as the cumulative reward increases. We can see from the graph that the reward estimate by this work group is always high because this group has achieved the most cumulative group rewards. About the surviving environment, we can notice a big difference in values. The three groups in the distributed knowledge scenario estimate high rewards because they are learning fast and getting rewards more often. Concerning the training time, the distributed knowledge scenario took longer than the common knowledge scenario, especially in the surviving environment. However, only distributed knowledge scenario showed good, showed good results in the surviving environment. We can see much more time. The results indicate that sharing knowledge among different groups in the same environment can bring better results. Agents learn to find rewards more efficiently, making less random decisions and fewer steps, make more accurate predictions, and decreasing the time it takes to complete tasks. This improved performance may be related to the smaller number of agents being coordinated by decentralized critics in the distribu distributed knowledge scenario. Also, in this scenario, agents have few observations and perceptions about the environment, so the neural network does not have to deal with as many inputs. We can conclude that specified centralized increase per knowledge in general improved the training process. However, the test execution time for the distributed knowledge scenario was much higher. So thanks everyone. Any questions? Thank you, Thais. We have Thank time you. for a few questions. Okay, I have some questions. Mm -hmm. uh, have you thought about doing this work in parallel, like GPU or something? Because then you could, you know, get better times or something? No, because the uh, in the ML agency unit, the, the creators in the, the blog and forums uh, respond to me about the, it's not in this kind of environment that I, uh, I use it to test, it's, more, it's much simple. And uh, I use tag in this uh, request sensor observation. So not it, uh, there is not much difference. So GPU and CPU. So I only test in the CPU. Okay. Another question is, have you thought about stressing your model, like putting many more agents and bigger scenarios to see how it would so, it work? Uh, uh, in the in the uh, second scenario, the survival environment, uh, I put 12 agents because in the first I test with four agents, so the results is better in the division knowledge scenario, but not so much. But with uh, when I increase the number of agents, uh, the criticals uh, take a longer time and it's difficult to coordinate to one critic coordinates 12 agents, so. I think in the in the environment with many agents, this 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 kind of approach is better. Yeah. Okay, let's see if we have more questions. Discord, YouTube. Oh, okay, so thank you. Thank you. So I guess we are at the end of our session. It was a very interesting session. I mean, reinforcement learning and artificial intelligence is more and more in our days, especially in games also. So it's good to see works related to this issue. I, I hope everybody enjoyed it and had a good time and learned something. I did. I learned more things, new things, and what's good. So thanks a lot, everybody, and see you around.